So, talking a little bit more about mentality. Uh, I spoke about Bain. They really have been extraordinary. I joined Endeavor uh, at Global about two years ago, two and a half. Uh, uh, I couldn't be luckier to have the people at Bain just helping me make my life a lot easier. Now, about four months ago, we had an ISP in Athens, and they invited Chris Zook. Chris Zook uh, um, um, has wrote several books. Profit from the Core, I think, is probably the most famous. Repeatability, which is my favorite. And, and I read it a long time ago. So I met Chris in Athens. Uh, um, you'll see Chris. He's tall. He has a smile ear to ear. He, 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 you'll see the smile. So I'm, um, hola, señor Suk, ¿cómo está? I'm a big fan of your book, Repeatability. I love it because of X, Y, and C, and A, B, and C. And Chris is, I don't care about repeatability anymore. That's old. So, you know, my eye is like this. I have a tear wanting to come up, but Senor Sue, what's going on? said, I'm now a lot more interested in why some people are actually achieving success, why people are repeating success over and over and others are not. And I'm calling that the founder's mentality. So I asked him, okay, Senor Sue, so, so what is the answer to the founder's mentality? And he said, I told you I just started. I don't have an answer. <laughs> I'm kind of hoping that he has an answer right now because if he doesn't, then I already gave you his keynote. Uh, so with that, please thank me in appreciating the presence of Chris Zook. <laughs> Thanks. I guess my final thought before jumping into it is, you know, it's amazing, you know, how many of these people we can recognize and yet, in a way, we're really in an age where the world is moving towards you. And I think the number of entrepreneurs who are becoming famous in the world now is an order of magnitude greater than it was 20 years ago, an order of magnitude greater than it was uh, 20 years before that. And I hope that, uh, that all of you, uh, it, it, or certainly many of you, have a chance that next time or years from now when we reformulate this slide that, uh, that you also uh, appear uh, on this. I have three big messages uh, for today that I want to, uh, want to share with you. One is a message about the world. Uh, you know, I think the founder's mentality is not a soft, uh, squishy thing of holding hands together and singing kumbaya. You know, I actually think it is a, a hard-edged uh, uh, phenomenon, which is what we're studying, which really translates into behaviors that give you a competitive advantage. And in some of the data that I will show you, I have become uh, convinced that it actually may be the strongest creator of value creation now today in the world. You know, we're seeing an enormous global resurgence of the importance of founders, and in many ways it is the engine, as Fernando pointed out, that is driving uh, many of the uh, most successful economies. <laughs> the second message is that, and, and it's amazing, you know, I've, I've spoken with maybe uh, 15 entrepreneurs uh, this session in depth for about an hour to an hour and a half but talked with many more of you in other sessions and in, in lesser, shorter conversations. And I believe that this is really true even for you, and it's even more true as you become larger and more successful. And that is that complexity is the silent killer of growth. Uh, it creates internally oriented, out of shape companies, it, and it can erode uh, the founder's mentality in ways that are pernicious and that you barely recognize, like heating up a frog degree by degree in water until suddenly the frog is almost dead and you hardly even noticed it happening. And uh, it's amazing. I would say two out of three of the stories that I heard are stories where already, even in your relatively small businesses, these issues are beginning to loom. So this is a point about what to avoid. And the third point is about what to pursue. What we have found in, in some work we've been doing at Bain over the last four or five years is that strategies that are based on what we've been coming, calling repeatable models, which I'll describe, maintain the founder's mentality longer and actually are mutually uh, reinforcing with it. Let me jump into the first uh, point about the world. Uh, if you look at, at many countries, this is the country that where the data was most easily accessible, but we're looking at this around the world and it's the same. 
uh, founder-led companies overwhelmingly outperform in every data set we look at uh, non-founder-led companies. This is the S&P 500, where the average returns over 10 years are higher, just splitting the S&P 500 into those that are and are not. Even more important in a world of uh, youth unemployment, which is growing to crisis proportion, certainly in Europe, but probably in the developing world too, and maybe in some ways in parts of America, you know, creation of jobs is very important, uh, even more important than it's ever been. And uh, governments are not creating those jobs. In fact, they're shrinking. Large bureaucracies of the world, like uh, Philips or Siemens, are not creating so many jobs anymore. They are laying people off. And when you look at where jobs come from, they come from groups like you uh, and the scaling of businesses. They don't come from small flower shops on the corner that don't expand. They come from groups that, or businesses that scale. And this just shows that 75% of job creation in the United States in a, in a survey that was done by the uh, uh, Kauffman Foundation were, were shown to be uh, driven by companies less than uh, 10 years old. We've been looking a lot at the developing world and the success of founder companies in the developing world. In fact, uh, just after this, I leave to go to India uh, to uh, speak with uh, 10, uh, 10 CEOs over a period of six or seven days on, uh, on this topic. So what we've been doing is examining some of the most successful companies in the developing world. And we particularly isolated about 158 of them. And we split them into really successful companies uh, with sustained and profitable growth that are growing mostly in their home market. Asian paints would be an example of that. You can come up with many. And then those that are actually gaining market share in the global markets against the uh, larger companies of the world. So maybe Hancock Tire gaining share against Michelin would be an example. And what you find when you look at those, and those are extremely important for creating foreign exchange, and ultimately that is the essence of a healthy economy that trades with the outside world, you find that actually two-thirds of the companies that are doing that, twice as many, uh, are uh, founder-led or strongly founder-related companies. Why is it? Why is it? I've asked myself this uh, a lot over the last uh, nine months or a year. Why is this? Why is it that founder-led companies seem to be having a resurgence? Part of it may be that technologies are less capital intensive, so you can start businesses faster. But I think that part of it also is that the world is changing faster. And you know, if you think about biology, uh, the ant is actually the most uh, adaptable creature. There is more biomass of ants in the world than there is biomass of humans and yet the, the dinosaur was the least adaptable. And I think there is something uh, that has been shown over and over about simplicity and focus and clarity in a world where adaptability is so important. You know, we heard uh, over the last couple of days so many examples of how much faster the world is moving. You know, the iPad uh, spreading as fast as it has and changing our life in three years. You know, the television took decades to get to the impact that it had on our life, not just, uh, not just three years. Or John Donahoe saying that in the next three years or so, we're going to see more change in the world of commerce than we've seen in the last 20. And there's just evidence after evidence after evidence of the speed of change. You know, one of the phenomena that changes, uh, drives change is uh, knowledge. And right now, there are 92% of all the scientists and engineers that have ever lived on planet Earth are alive generating knowledge, therefore at a very rapid rate and with more powerful tools of networking that is really accelerating it almost beyond the level at which we can even use it. Let me show you a chart. I have 20 of these on the C drive of my computer. And I think it's really amazing. I've been Bain for, for, uh, as the head of strategy for the last 15 years and uh, have been watching, we've been watching this as a company for the last 40 years. But never have I seen anything quite like this. And uh, I mean, I've per particularly uh, chosen a capital intensive industry that doesn't change so fast, an industry that's been around that doesn't change so fast. But just check this out. So this is a really simple chart. This is the market value of the top 20 airlines in the world uh, about uh, a little bit more than 10 years ago. The blue are the ones that are headquartered in the North America and in the EU, and the gray are the rest of the world. So you see, for example, that American Airlines 10 years ago was the most valuable. Now fast forward uh, about five years, and you see that uh, five or six have gone bankrupt or been acquired. Uh, you see American Airlines has gone down rapidly in market value. Then uh, fast forward now to the present, close to the present. And you see that another almost two-thirds of the ones that were on the chart have been merged or acquired and are gone. 
You see American Airlines, nope, there it goes. <laughs> Off the chart, amazing, 10 years. And you see uh, the addition of enormous number of airlines in the developing world. But particularly when you look at this, you see a predominance of founder-related uh, companies. Uh, you see EasyJet, you see AirAsia, you see Ryanair as uh, the most, one of the most profitable airlines in the world. Very focused, uh, uh, very repeatable business model, uh, very infused with the founder mentality. Amazing. I mean, who would have thought that Lan and Tam Airways was uh, a, a, essentially the most valuable airway, airline in the world uh, now, where in, in South America, Bain is working on the integration of those two companies, whereas uh, 10 years ago, I bet most of us would not have even heard of either one of them. You know, this change and, and churn is a reason why uh, the data on this chart looks as it does. So what is the data on this chart? At Bain, for the last 25 years, we have a database of the top 8,000 companies in the world. And we use it to ask simple questions. So we use it to ask questions like, you know, what per percentage of companies achieve even a modest level of sustained and profitable growth over 10 years? On average, not every year, on average. And we defined it in a pretty conservative way. 5.5% real revenue and profit growth and earning the cost of capital. Now, all of you aspire to four or five times that. But, you know, even within Bain, where we work for a lot of bigger companies, you cannot walk around many offices that, and find uh, companies that don't aspire to this. And yet the truth is that something that everybody aspires to, only now one in 10 companies actually achieves that. Competitive advantage is more ephemeral, and the ability to maintain uh, profitable advantage is actually becoming more difficult than ever. When we looked at that set of 12%, 10, one out of 10 companies that do achieve that on average over 10 years, what we found was that actually two-thirds of those were companies where you could really see the imprint of the founder still on the business. These were not the bureaucracies that had sort of lost their soul over time. These were companies that uh, uh, either the founder was the CEO still, Google, the founder was uh, related uh, to the company and, uh, uh, and, and, and on, the, on, on the board, say Mahindra and Mahindra, a company like that in India or the company so clearly had the elements of the founder mentality in place, let's say Apple, even after uh, uh, Steve Jobs. Similarly, when we looked at the total shareholder returns for those companies within the 12%, you find that they are really off the chart. 212% uh, 10-year uh, uh, return versus 23% uh, for the others, 10 times different. And finally, when we looked at those companies, the sustained value creators, that were uh, related to the founder. So that two-thirds of, of the 10%, sort of a very pure uh, group of what obviously we all and all of you aspire to, you, you find the job creation rate is uh, four times higher. And obviously, compounding over time, the power of compound interest means that the numbers of jobs created is many times even more than that. So uh, what is the founder mentality? And, and is there something tangible about, about that that's worth understanding? So we've begun uh, interviewing entrepreneurs. We've begun studying this in more analytic detail in Bain. Those of you who have worked with us know that we uh, love data and uh, love marinating and wallowing in, uh, in data. And there are five elements that seem to be coming forward. And I think that each one of you, so you say, well, fine, so what? I, I, my suggestion or just thought is that this, this provides a list and that each one of you in your businesses perhaps occasionally looks at this list or a list like it and says, are these things eroding? And I've, you know, even going from 10 to 100 employees or 100 to 1,000, let alone 1,000 to 10,000, uh, I think that the winds begin to push you away from these elements. So what are they? One is the ability to have a longer-term vision, a bold mission, something that really energizes people. All of you have that uh, by, in spades. Huge companies very often uh, lose that, and this erodes over time. And yet, you know what a powerful engine of motivation it is. It's probably why a lot of you are doing what you're doing. You know, an example of that would certainly be Endeavor, uh, you know, a business of network of networks of entrepreneurs and what the, the organization could be in 
10 years could be really amazing. I think a second element that can erode over time and is really important is the owner mindset. Thinking about your money, every single penny, almost as if it is yours, and in many cases, it is yours. You know, an example that is uh, an interesting one, I think, is uh, uh, George Paulo Lehman and Marcel Tellis, who in, in, in the late 1980s bought a uh, money losing beer uh, brewery in Brazil, Brahma and Bavaria, and ultimately created a repeatable model around it, which uh, now is uh, the kernel, we'll come back to this example, of the largest beer company in the world. But as you'll see in their, their core principles, which they've written down, uh, this is one of them. And I think they're amazing at it. A third element is staying close to the front line. You know, every founder was essentially the product developer and the first, uh, and the salesman. Talk to the first customer and you knew them intimately. You knew them, their names, you knew the, the, their variation. And uh, that is a huge asset, knowing the frontline employees as you grow and knowing the customer. And I have seen uh, people's calendar in bigger companies where the senior executives spend less than 5% of their time with frontline employees and uh, customers. And how can you make decisions if uh, you're a general and you are uh, that far away from the battlefield? You know, I think sh shutting down the stores when Howard Schultz came back to retrain the baristas and focus on the front line and redesign the structure of the coffee machines so they were lower and you could see the whole barista behind. All these minute details that helped restore Starbucks are an example of that. Passion for simplicity. You know, we've all uh, heard the story of, of uh, Steve Jobs cutting down to four products as one of his first things when he did returning to Apple and creating that kind of focus. And finally, talent obsession. I'm sorry for using Bain as a commercial. You know, the, I, I was at Bain also in the early years. I left then to be involved in small businesses and came back. But the founders, all of them mentored me personally. And I think this chain of mentoring isn't perfect now, but it still is very strong. And uh, you know, how we treat people is a reason why Bain has received for 10 years in a row, no one has ever gotten this, the award in the world, for the company that treats its employees uh, the best, manages its, it's the best consulting firm to work for in the world. And uh, I think it traces back to the founder mentality and maintaining that Bain is a founder mentality company. When we lose it, we're in big trouble. But you know, I asked the, we asked the question, one question, what are the elements in your mind of the founder mentality that creates advantage? And you can see almost the identical uh, elements that are in the ones that we've been, uh, been working on. So I think we are well aligned on it. Maybe it's obvious, but you know, I think what is really interesting is how do you maintain it as you begin to scale? That's the trick. 93% of, uh, of you felt that the founder mentality was a major competitive advantage. One person wrote to us, uh, you know, without the founder mentality, we wouldn't be able to scale we'd be managing rather than inspiring others to think uh, and act like us. And I can relate to that from the early years of Bain. Another question we asked is uh, the difficulty, though, uh, in preserving it. And even at the relatively moderate size of many of your businesses, two-thirds of you say that you are already feeling these tensions. This is one of the few abstract charts I will use. It is not a good thing to use abstract charts on a Friday afternoon, I know, but this is a simple one. And what it shows is two dimensions. One is where many of you are now. Relatively small, moderate scale, which is the left-hand side, but uh, strong, powerful, tangible, clear strength on these five dimensions of the founder mentality. Certainly the holy grail is to create a repeatable model where you maintain that, like maybe IKEA has in some ways. Here you have a 60 billion euro company where the founder principles, the core concept of the business is still exists with 10 times relative market share in Europe and 25 years of outgrowing their industry by two and a half times, or enterprise rent-a-car. This is the holy grail. Maintain the founder mentality while scaling. 